Thank you, Barbara, and thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I wanted to bring your mind back about uh, five and a half years. Uh, if I can get the right video here for you. And remind you, see if you can remember your experience when you heard this. This morning, I am pleased to announce five new temples for which sites have been acquired and which in coming months and years will be built in the following locations. Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Cordoba, Argentina. The greater Kansas City area. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Rome, Italy. To me, it's the dramatic hush, the, the, sigh, the sigh of awe, and the chuckle at the end that's, that speaks volumes about the spread of temples around the earth. Uh, to have a name like Rome, Italy announced, uh, I can only imagine what the, what the drama will be when a temple is announced for Far West, or for Independence, or for Jerusalem. Uh, but that kind of, uh, of spreading, that globalization of the temple, is what I hope to talk about today. When I was young, um, I had a dream of going to see all 40 temples in the world. Uh, President Hinckley shot that goal out of the water. Uh, currently, we're at 142 temples, and as part of this, uh, of this research for this paper, uh, I studied the 165 temple dedicatory prayers that have been offered to dedicate or rededicate the temples uh, of the latter days. Uh, it was truly an incredible experience studying those. I was able to play the part of a rhetorical critic uh, as these two rhetoricians said, it gives you the chance to act like an anthropologist who finds in the smallest ritual a complete depiction of tribal history and culture. I was able to approach each prayer because they, each is worth examining, not simply because it exists, but because it promises to tell a story larger than itself. And I'm hoping that we can examine that larger story together today. Uh, the long and short of it, uh, I would argue that Latter-day temples do not simply evince sacred space but serve to establish and extend it. Uh, in other words, temple dedications initiate the spread of sacred space. Now, in some ways, that's a different look at things. Joseph Smith, as you all know, know this statement, uh, said that the object of gathering the people of God in any age was to build temples so that God could reveal his ordinances to his children. Uh, that gathering in the ancient world uh, to Jerusalem was the sense of the axis mundi, the, the navel of the, of the universe, that this one spot of inherent holiness directly beneath the throne of God uh, was inherent because of its own, in, uh, was, it was sacred because of its own inherent sacredness. There's a sense of that somewhat in Doctrine and Covenants 57 uh, when speaking of the city of Zion and the temple to be built there, says, speaks of the, this place which is now called Independence as the center place. This is all singular. A spot for the temple is lying westward upon a lot which is not far from the courthouse. Again, very specific in its direction. And yet, at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple in 1836, you get this plurality more than the singularness, uh, that they may gather out of that city the righteous, that they may come forth to Zion or to her stakes, plural, the places, plural, of thine appointment, that God would appoint unto Zion other stakes besides this one which thou hast appointed, and again connecting it back to the gathering, which Joseph connects always with temple building, uh, that the gathering of thy people may roll on in great power and majesty. This statement is a very famous one, 1972 from Elder Bruce R. McConkie at an area conference in Mexico and Central America. The place of gathering for the Mexican saints is in Mexico. The place of gathering for the Guatemalan saints is in Guatemala. The place of gathering for the Brazilian saints is in Brazil, and so it goes throughout the length and breadth of the whole earth. Japan is for the Japanese. Korea is for the Koreans. Australia, where Elder McConkie was mission president, is for the Australians. Every nation is the gathering place for its own people. Now, obviously, this was not to critique multiculturalism, international exchange, immigration, anything like that, but rather a, a new phase of the gathering. Uh, President Harold B. Lee, in the, in the following general conference, reiterated and reconfirmed everything that Elder McConkie said in that earlier re regional conference, that area conference. Uh, and then um, almost two decades later, President Packer reminded us of that statement from Elder McConkie and said that the pioneering phase of gathering was over. At the dedication of the Copenhagen Denmark Temple, President Hinckley prayed, most converts emigrated to their Zion in the early seasons of this work. Now thy people are urged to remain and build Zion in this good land. 
that they, may, that they might have every blessing and that they might extend these blessings to those beyond the veil of death, this beautiful temple has been constructed in their midst. And that really tells the story of the last two decades of temple construction and church growth. If you go back to that 1972 statement from Elder McConkie, the six nations that he mentioned specifically at the time in 1972 were home to zero temples uh, collectively. Within the next 13 years, each of those temples, each, each of those nations had one temple. And if you look at the map today, uh, including those temples which are announced or under construction, there are a total of 32 temples just in the six nations that Elder McConkie mentioned as being gathering places for those local Latter-day Saints. If you, if you look at the map and see what it looked like in the 19th century uh, versus the early 20th century versus now in the early 21st century, temples truly are beginning to dot the earth. The number in Utah, which at the beginning of the, of the 20th century inclu included all of the temples. Uh, the pink, the number in the United States has grown considerably, but particularly those international temples have grown again in the last two decades primarily. Another way to look at that is the percentage of temples. In the year 1900, 100% of the temples of the church, all four of them, were built in the state of Utah. Uh, shortly thereafter, we began seeing temples outside of Utah and after that outside of the United States until the last, oh, 10 years or so, it's evened out that Utah temples uh, have about 10% of the total, uh, the United States temples about half, and international temples about half the temples in the church, which says something. I think when we dedicate nations, it shows the initiation of the work in an area. When we dedicate chapels, it shows the, the continuation of the work in that area. But when we build temples, as was said in the Hong Kong China temple dedication, it is a sign that the church has come to full maturity in that area. For Pidi Tahiti, the temples are a capstone to all earlier effort. And Asuncion Paraguay, the temples are a crowning jewel to God's work in each nation. To me, a poignant example is President Hinckley's dedicatory prayer at the Manila Philippines Temple. Only at 23 years after President Hinckley himself had initiated uh, formal missionary work there in that country, and as he dedicated that temple, he prayed, its, t its completion brings to full fruition the marvelous and wonderful work of establishing thine eternal ordinances in this nation. Similar language is in many temple dedicatory prayers. That only tells part of the story. That is the spreading of temples across the earth. But to me, the more exciting part of this research in temple dedicatory prayers was the spreading that takes place from the temples that, as I was able to distinguish, comes in three different areas. A spreading that takes place ontologically and geographically, which establishes sacred places across the earth. Uh, a spreading that takes place sacramentally and spiritually, creating sacred people. And a spreading that takes place historically and, cultural, and culturally, that gives to people around the world a sacred past to call their own. Speaking first of the ontological and geographical spreading, these sacred places that are created around the world. This takes place at the dedication, specifically at the dedicatory prayer it's offering and the giving of the Hosanna shout afterwards. At the Manaus, Brazil temple, it was said that at the dedication, a mantle of holiness comes upon the sacred edifice. Or when Nauvoo was dedicated originally, uh, Elder Hors Orson Hyde spoke of the guardianship of the temple, passing from human to divine hands. Not a member of the church, but a philosopher of language, J.L. Austin spoke of speaking uh, s distinguishing different ki kinds, locutionary acts, which covers everything that we say, but perlocutionary acts, which he described as not merely descriptive, but constitutive. In other words, in a dedicatory prayer, for example, it's not just that the, uh, that the apostle or prophet is describing what is occurring. Rather, the apostle is accomplishing the feat in the actual act of speaking. Austin calls these performatives and define that as outward and visible signs of an inward and spiritual act. In some ways, it reminds us of Carlos E. Acey's definition of the garment uh, and comparing in interior with exter exterior. And the language, the, the verbiage of dedicatory prayers is that type of performative. Dedicatory prayers have changed somewhat over the years. When Salt Lake was dedicated in 1893 by Wilfred Woodruff, that dedicatory prayer was over 5,100 words. When El President Amundsen dedicated the Calgary, Alberta temple, that was only 803. Uh, basically, the same three elements exist in, in old as well as new dedicatory prayers. Uh, gratitude for the restoration is mentioned, appeals for blessings on various groups, as well as the consecration of the temple itself. That's been one of the more dramatic uh, changes. In 1893, President Wilfred Woodruff dedicated everything. 
uh, you name the architectural detail and he dedicated it. Uh, whereas currently it is much more general in terms of things, typical language would be everything from the deepest foundation to the highest spire uh, and everything all inclusive. Uh, an example of this uh, that I found interesting was in 1877 when the St. George Utah Temple was dedicated. Uh, when they first dug the foundation uh, in the spot that Brigham Young had said was for the, the temple there, they discovered that there were underground springs that made the ground more swampy than solid. Rather than change the temple site, they decided to change the temple soil. And so they crushed lava rock using an old uh, cannon as a pile driver. Uh, but you could tell that uh, Daniel H. Wells, in offering the dedicatory prayer, was still a little concerned about his unorthodox foundation construction. And so he prayed that the foundation of the temple may not give way nor yield in consequence of any destructive elements which may be in the soil, but may the nature of those elements be changed so as to become strengthening instead of weakening, that the same may always remain firm and sound. In other words, he prayed for a literal change in the soil beneath the temple. I think the same happens frequently in temple dedicatory prayers. Not so much a literal change in soil composition, but rather in the spirituality of the area, an ontological change. Uh, Lorenzo Snow, in dedicating the Manti Temple, asked that it be known as a delightful location, as a holy hill of Zion. And when President Hinckley rededicated that same temple years later, he prayed, bless the land where stands thy temple, this community, the state, the nation. You get this sense of concentric circles of sacredness that spread outward from the temple itself. And the Oakland, California temple dedication, extend this influence that peace may soon be established upon the earth. A Pia Samoa, may there emanate from this temple a spirit of peace and righteousness that will reach out into the homes of thy people. May even those who are not of thy church experience something of thy divine spirit radiated from this thy holy house. That language of sacred radiation is ubiquitous in temple dedications. President Hinckley prayed that the San Diego Temple would be a thing of singular beauty from which shall emanate a spiritual glow that speaks of peace and goodness. And Tampico, Mexico, that there may emanate from this thy house a spirit of love and peace, a spirit divine and holy, which shall be felt in this great city. Johannesburg, South Africa, this is on a national scale. May the presence of thy house on the soil of this land bring blessings to the entire nation. And in Hong Kong, China, may it shed forth an aura of holiness that will be felt in this great community of people. May the very environment be edified by the presence of thy house. Some are meant to spread beyond national boundaries. Home Sweden was dedicated. May the dedication of this temple usher in a new era for thy work in all of Scandinavia. Similar language appearing in the Hague Netherlands temple dedication. In Taiwan, may thy work spread from here to the vast numbers of thy Chinese sons and daughters wherever they may be found. Reiterated again in Hong Kong. Accra, Ghana. May Ghana become a model among the nations of this vast continent which again was repeated uh, among the Central American nations when Guatemala City finally had a temple, and again among the Scandinavian nations uh, when Helsinki, Finland was dedicated. Mercia Eliadi spoke of sacred space as a break in the homogeneity of space, an absolute fixed point, a center. He said it was always found and never chosen, that it was detached from and not connected to its profane surroundings, and that it's a, the cosmic breakthrough that it accomplished was on the vertical rather than the horizontal axis. I would say that in Latter-day Saint temples, we agree with much of that, but each has to be qualified. That yes, often the ground is, dis is discovered rather than designated, but at other times, temples, especially in this age of zoning ordin ordin ordinances and, uh, and over-urbanization, uh, temples can create the sacred space rather than show where it is. And yes, it is detached from, there is that uh, separation, but at the same time, temples are meant to spread outward their influence. Uh, making that cosmic breakthrough as horizontal as it is vertical, uh, reaching not just to the living and the dead, but the living and the living, not just between the heaven and the earth, but the earth and the earth, and temples accomplish that. Speaking of the sacramental and the spiritual, President Monson, who is so good at, at the, the personal side of things, in multiple temple dedicatory prayers has prayed, as we dedicate this sacred edifice, we rededicate our very lives to thee and to thy work. And that similar language of rededicating us is found in the 19th century as well as the 20th century uh, temple dedicatory prayers. Uh, a good example is the Reno, Nevada temple where President Monson dedicated not only the beautiful baptistry, but the youth who come to be baptized. Not just the endowment rooms, but all who come to be endowed. Not simply the ceiling rooms and their sacred altars, but rather those who are sealed in this thy house. Bas based more on saints than structures. Edification rather than edifices. 
ritualizations is one of the things uh, that you can speak of uh, dedications and dedicatory prayers. Uh, scholars define this as sets of interlocking practices by which the participants or orient themselves to one another, to aspects of their own selves, to outsiders or non-practitioners, and to the sacred other. And if you unpack that statement, all of those take place in dedications, and all of them can be found in elements of dedicatory prayers as well, as we orient and empower the people who hear these prayers and the people who read them subsequently. At the Manhattan Temple dedication, may they, the saints who come, carry with them something of the sweet and edifying experience which they have had here. Or in Billings, Montana, bless thy people throughout the earth that wherever they may be established, they may become as a city set upon a hill whose light cannot be hid, even as this temple standing on this eminence may be seen from afar. Often temple dedicatory prayers speak of, in almost all of them, they pray that the gospel may spread to the nations of the earth. But often that is specifically connected to the endowments that missionaries receive from that building before they head out to accomplish that work. John Taylor's example from the Logan, Utah temple is one of my favorites. He prayed that, those, that through the ordinances of the temple, the saints would be enabled more fully to comprehend our duties, responsibilities, and obligations pertaining to all men in the various conditions and associations of life that we may be enabled to act justly, prudently, righteously, and intelligently in all the various relations of life pertaining to social, religious, political, and other duties devolving upon us, and that we may comprehend always fully the relationship that we sustain to this nation, to other nations, and to the world generally in which we live, and understand more perfectly our responsibilities to the living and the dead, to the wicked and corrupt, to the honorable and upright among men. This is about as all-inclusive a, p a petition as you can find that because of the ordinances and power of the temple, we are meant to bless the world culturally, politically, uh, in every possible way. Historically and culturally, temple dedications offer the nation where they are found a sacred past to call their own. Some of these places are obvious, such as the Palmyra, Winter Quarters, and Nauvoo, Illinois temples, hearkening back to those periods of church history. Some are one step removed. The Columbus, Ohio temple dedicatory prayer harkens back to the Kirtland Temple, and in Chicago, hearkening back to the persecution in Nauvoo and St. Louis, speaking of the persecution the saints suffered in Missouri. In the Kansas City, Missouri Temple, an example of that, this temple stands on ground hallowed by the sacrifice and sufferings of stalwart saints who walked here long years ago. In other places, it, it connects them to a scriptural ancestry. The temple dedicatory prayers, speaking of the sons and daughters of Lehi in the areas of Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Peru, Bolivia, Arizona, California, Utah, and Alberta. And even more interestingly, in Laie, Hawaii, Nuku'alofa, Tonga, and Hamilton, New Zealand, all speaking of that scriptural ancestry and the people in those, in those nations. Others speak of the sacred past in their own period of church history. Laie, Hawaii, speaking of the early missions there. Oakland, the, the voyage of the saints and Sam, Sam Brandon's ship. Uh, the conversion of Kim Ho-jik uh, leading to the, the work in Seoul, Korea or Melvin J. Ballard's prophecy of church growth in Argentina. Others are even less connected directly to the history of the church, but rather the history of salvation upon the earth, giving these areas and the saints that live there a, a piece of the puzzle of God's work in the world. Uh, the voyage of Columbus from Spanish shores into Spain and Madrid temple dedicatory prayer. English reformers you know, connecting reformation and restoration in the London, England prayer. English law and the English Bible highlighted in Preston, England, and the events leading to the American independence when Boston, Massachusetts was dedicated. Uh, in conclusion, it's not just the ontological, it's not just the geographical, it's not just the historical. In, it, you'll see even in literal ways in more current temples about the last 10 years or so, uh, that even the architectural and the aesthetic is bringing in local elements. Uh, Shoshone Falls, for example, is shown in the murals of the uh, Twin Falls, Idaho Temple. Wheat uh, is omnipresent in the Rexburg, Idaho Temple, honoring the agricultural uh, basis of its, of its region. The Statue of Liberty Torch is in the door handles of the Manhattan, New York Temple, uh, and the hibiscus flower in uh, art glass in Laie, Hawaii. State and national flowers are, are much more frequently used currently. Uh, again, to bring in that nation, to give the, the people there a sense that their area is deserving of sacred space. Uh, architecturally on a grand scale, the Tijuana Mexico Temple, currently under, uh, under construction, is a beautiful example of Spanish colonial architecture. Sapporo, Japan, looks very Asian in its architecture, and beautifully so. 
and the Hartford, Connecticut temple, when the design was shown uh, to a non-member uh, zoning uh, official, said it was shockingly New England uh, and said so approvingly. Uh, finally, the cultural dedications that began in, uh, the, excuse me, the cultural celebrations that began in 2004 with the Accra Ghana Temple dedication, giving the saints there, particularly the rising generation, a sense that their culture, that their heritage, uh, that their background is deserving of sacredness and can, can qualify as sacred uh, time and sacred space and sacred people as well. Lastly, when President George Albert Smith dedicated the Idaho Falls Temple, he prayed, hasten the day when righteousness shall cover the earth as the waters cover the mighty deep, which President Hinckley reiterated years later, praying in Washington state, may the whole earth become a Zion as thy work spreads among the nations. That is what is occurring as temple by temple, dedication by te dedication, more and more places around the world are fulfilling the petition of Gordon B. Hinckley, offered in Newport Beach, California. This sacred spot of earth has become holy unto us. I offer this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs>